Black Boy, A Record of Childhood and Youth by Richard Wright. Copyright 1937, 1942, 1944, 1945 by Richard Wright. Afterward, copyright 1966 by Harper and Row Publishers. For Ellen and Julia, who live always in my heart. They meet with darkness in the daytime, and they grope at noonday as in the night. Job. Introductory Note More than 85 years ago, Oliver Wendell Holmes nobly said, It is so much easier to consign a soul to perdition, or to say prayers to save it, than to take the blame on ourselves for letting it grow up in neglect and run to ruin. The English law began, only in the late 18th century, to get hold of the idea that crime is not necessarily a sin. The limitations of human responsibility have never been properly studied. If Dr. Holmes were alive now, he would be proud, as I am proud, of the chance to help bring to the thoughtful attention of intelligent, morally responsible Americans the honest, dreadful, heartbreaking story of a Negro childhood and youth as set down by that rarely gifted American author. Richard Wright Dorothy Cansfield Fisher Arlington, Vermont Chapter 1 One winter morning in the long ago four-year-old days of my life I found myself standing before a fireplace warming my hands over a mound of glowing coals listening to the wind whistle past the house outside all morning my mother had been scolding me, telling me to keep still, warning me that I must make no noise. And I was angry, fretful and impatient. In the next room, Granny lay ill and under the day and night care of a doctor, and I knew that I would be punished if I did not obey. I crossed restlessly to the window and pushed back the long, fluffy white curtains which I had been forbidden to touch, and looked yearningly out into the empty street. I was dreaming of running and playing and shouting, but the vivid image of Granny's old, white, wrinkled, grim face, framed by a halo of tumbling black hair, lying upon a huge feather pillow, made me afraid. The house was quiet. Behind me, my brother, a year younger than I, was playing placidly upon the floor with a toy. A bird wheeled past the window, and I greeted it with a glad shout. You better hush, my brother said. You shut up, I said. My mother stepped briskly into the room and closed the door behind her. She came to me and shook her finger in my face. You stop that yelling, you hear? She whispered. You know Granny's sick, and you better keep quiet. I hung my head and sulked. She left, and I ached with boredom. I told you so, my brother gloated. You shut up, I told him again. I wandered listlessly about the room, trying to think of something to do, dreading the return of my mother, resentful of being neglected. The room held nothing of interest except the fire, and finally I stood before the shimmering embers, fascinated by the quivering coals. An idea of a new kind of game grew and took root in my mind. Why not throw something into the fire and watch it burn? I looked about. There was only my picture book, and my mother would beat me if I burned that. Then what? I hunted around until I saw the broom leaning in a closet. That's it. 
Who would bother about a few straws if I burned them? I pulled out the broom and tore out a batch of straws and tossed them into the fire and watched them smoke, turn black, blaze, and finally become white wisp of ghost that vanished. Burning straws was a teasing kind of fun, and I took more of them from the broom and cast them into the fire. My brother came to my side, his eyes drawn by the blazing straws. Don't do that, he, he said. How come? I asked. You'll burn the whole broom, he said. You hush, I said. I'll tell, he said. And I'll hit you, I said. My idea was growing, blooming. Now I was wondering just how the long fluffy white curtains would look if I lit a bunch of straws and held it under them. Would I try it? Sure. I pulled several straws from the broom and held them to the fire until they blazed. I rushed to the window and brought the flame in touch with the hems of the curtains. My brother shook his head. No, nah, he said. He spoke too late. Red circles were eating into the white cloth. Then a flare of flame shot out. Startled, I backed away. The fire soared to the ceiling, and I trembled with fright. Soon a sheet of yellow lit the room. I was terrified. I wanted to scream, but was afraid. I looked around for my brother. He was gone. One half of the room was now ablaze. Smoke was choking me, and the fire was licking at my face, making me gasp. I made for the kitchen. Smoke was surging there, too. Soon my mother would smell that smoke and see the fire and come and beat me. I had done something wrong, something which I could not hide or deny. Yes, I would run away and never come back. I ran out of the kitchen and into the backyard. Where could I go? Yes, under the house. Nobody would find me there. I crawled under the house and crept into a dark hollow of a brick chimney and boiled myself into a tight knot. My mother must not find me and whip me for what I had done. Anyway, it was all an accident. I had not really intended to set the house afire. I had just wanted to see how the curtains would look when they burned. And neither did it occur to me that I was hiding under a burning house. Presently, footsteps pounded on the floor above me. Then I heard screams. Later, the gongs of fire wagons and the clopping hoofs of horses came from the direction of the street. Yes, there was really a fire. A fire like the one I had seen one day burn a house down to the ground, leaving only a chimney standing black. I was stiff with terror. The thunder of sound above me shook the chimney to which I clung. The screams came louder. I saw the image of my grandmother lying helplessly upon her bed and there were yellow flames in her black hair. Was my mother a fire? Would my brother burn? Perhaps everybody in the house would burn. Why had I not thought of these things before I fired the curtains? I yearned to become invisible, to stop living. The commotion above me increased, and I began to cry. It seemed that I had been hiding for ages, and when the stomping and screaming died down, I felt lonely, cast forever out of life. Voices sounded nearby, and I shivered. Richard! My mother was calling frantically. I saw her legs and the hem of her dress moving swiftly about the backyard. Her wheels were full of an agony whose intensity told me that my punishment would be measured by its depth. Then I saw her tout face peering under the edge of the house. She had found me. I held my breath and waited to hear her command me to come to her. Her face went away. No. She had not seen me huddled in the dark nook of the chimney. I tucked my head into my arms and my teeth chattered. Richard! The distress I sensed in her voice was as sharp and painful 
as the lash of a whip on my flesh. Richard! The house is on fire! Oh, find my child! Yes, the house was a fire, but I was determined not to leave my place of safety. Finally, I saw another face peering under the edge of the house. It was my father's. His eyes must have become accustomed to the shadows, for he was now pointing at me. There he is. No, I screamed. Come here, boy. No, the house is on fire. Leave me alone. He crawled to me and caught hold of one of my legs. I hugged the edge of the brick chimney with all of my strength. My father yanked my leg and clawed at the chimney harder. Come out of there, you little fool. Turn me loose. I could not withstand the tugging at my leg, and my fingers relaxed. It was over. I would be beaten. I did not care any more. I knew what was coming. He dragged me into the backyard, and the instant his hand left me, I jumped to my feet and broke into a wild run, trying to elude the people who surrounded me heading for the street. I was caught before I had gone ten paces. From that moment on, things became tangled for me. Out of the weeping and the shouting and the wild talk, I learned that no one had died in the fire. My brother, it seemed, had finally overcome enough of his panic to warn my mother, but not before more than half the house had been destroyed. Using the mattress as a stretcher, Grandpa and an uncle had lifted Granny from her bed and had rushed her to the safety of a neighbor's house. My long absence and silence had made everyone think, for a while, that I had perished in the blaze. You almost scared us to death, my mother muttered as she stripped the leaves from a tree limb to prepare it for my back. I was lashed so hard and long that I lost consciousness. I was beaten out of my senses and later I found myself in bed, screaming, determined to run away, tussling with my mother and father who were trying to keep me still. I was lost in a fog of fear. A doctor was called, I was afterwards told, and he ordered that I be kept abed that I be kept quiet, that my very life depended upon it. My body seemed on fire and I could not sleep. Packs of ice were put on my forehead to keep down the fever. Whenever I tried to sleep, I would see huge wobbly white bags, like the full udders of cows, suspended from the ceiling above me. Later, as I grew worse, I could see the bags in the daytime with my eyes open and I was gripped by the fear that they were going to fall and drench me with some horrible liquid. Day and night I begged my mother and father to take the bags away, pointing to them, shaking with terror because no one saw them but me. Exhaustion would make me drift toward sleep and then I would scream until I was wide awake again. I was afraid to sleep. Time finally bore me away from the dangerous bags and I got well. But for a long time, I was chastened whenever I remembered that my mother had come close to killing me. Each event spoke with a cryptic tongue, and the moments of living slowly revealed their coded meanings. There was the wonder I felt when I first saw a brace of mountain-like spotted black and white horses clopping down a dusty road through clouds of powdered clay. There was the delight I caught in seeing long straight rows of red and green vegetables stretching away in the sun to the bright horizon. There was the faint, cool kiss of sensuality when dew came onto my cheeks and shins as I ran down the wet green garden paths in the early morning. There was the vague sense of the infinite 
as I looked down upon the yellow, dreaming waters of the Mississippi River from the verdant bluffs of Natchez. There were the echoes of nostalgia I heard in the crying strings of wild geese winging south against a bleak autumn sky. There was the tantalizing melancholy in the tingling scent of burning hickory wood. There was the teasing and impossible desire to imitate the petty pride of sparrows wallowing and flouncing in the red dust of country roads. There was the yearning for identification loosed in me by the sight of a solitary ant carrying a burden upon a mysterious journey. There was the disdain that filled me as I tortured a delicate blue-pink crawfish that huddled fearfully in the mud sill of a rusty tin can. There was the aching glory in masses of clouds burning gold and purple from an invisible sun. There was the liquid alarm I saw in the blood-red glare of the sun's afterglow mirrored in the squared panes of whitewashed frame houses. There was the languor I felt when I heard green leaves rustling with the rain-like sound. There was the incomprehensible secret embodied in a whitish toadstool hiding in the dark shade of a rotting log. There was the experience of feeling death without dying that came from watching a chicken leap about blindly after its neck had been snapped by a quick twist of my father's wrist. There was the great joke that I felt God had played on cats and dogs by making them lap their milk and water with their tongues. There was the thirst I had when I watched clear, sweet juice trickle from sugar cane being crushed. There was the hot panic that welled up in my throat and swept through my blood when I first saw the lazy, limp coils of a blue-skinned snake sleeping in the sun. There was the speechless astonishment of seeing a hog stabbed through the heart, dipped into boiling water, scraped, split open, gutted, and strung up, gaping and bloody. There was the love I had for the mute regality of tall, moss-clad oaks. There was the hint of cosmic cruelty that I felt when I saw the curved timbers of a wooden shack that had been warped in the summer sun. There was the saliva that formed in my mouth whenever I smelt clay dust potted with fresh rain. There was the cloudy notion of hunger when I breathed the odor of new-cut bleeding grass. And there was a quiet terror that suffused my senses when vast hazes of gold washed earthward from star-heavy skies on silent nights. One day my mother told me that we were going to Memphis on a boat, the Kate Adams, and my eagerness thereafter made the day seem endless. Each night I went to bed hoping that the next morning would be the day of departure. How big is the boat? I asked my mother. As big as a mountain, she said. Has it got a whistle? Yes. Does the whistle blow? Yes. When? When the captain wants it to blow. Why do they call it the Kate Adams? Because that's the boat's name. What color is the boat? White. How long will we be on the boat? All day and all night. Will we sleep on the boat? Yes, when we get sleepy, we'll sleep. Now hush. For days, I had dreamed about a huge white boat 
floating on a vast body of water. But when my mother took me down to the levee on the day of leaving, I saw a tiny, dirty boat that was not at all like the boat I had imagined. I was disappointed, and when time came to go on board, I cried, and my mother thought that I did not want to go with her to Memphis, and I could not tell her what the trouble was. Solace came when I wandered about the boat and gazed at Negroes throwing dice, drinking whiskey, playing cards, lolling on boxes, eating, talking, and singing. My father took me down into the engine room and the throbbing machines enthralled me for hours. In Memphis, we lived in a one-story brick tenement. The stone buildings and the concrete pavements looked bleak and hostile to me. The absence of green, growing things made the city seem dead. Living space for the four of us, my mother, my brother, my father, and me, was a kitchen and a bedroom. In the front and rear were paved areas in which my brother and I could play. But for days I was afraid to go into the strange city streets alone. It was in this tenement that the personality of my father first came fully into the orbit of my concern. He worked as a night porter in a Bill Street drugstore and he became important and forbidding to me only when I learned that I could not make noise when he was asleep in the daytime. He was the lawgiver in our family, and I never laughed in his presence. I used to lurk timidly in the kitchen doorway and watch his huge body sitting slumped at the table. I stared at him with awe as he gulped his beer from a tin bucket, as he ate long and heavily, sighed, belched, closed his eyes to nod on a stuffed belly. He was quite fat and his bloated stomach always lapped over his belt. He was always a stranger to me, always somehow alien and remote. One morning my brother and I, while playing in the rear of our flat, found a stray kitten that set up a loud, persistent meowing. We fed it some scraps of food and gave it water, but it still meowed. My father, clad in his underwear, stumbled sleepily to the back door and demanded that we keep quiet. We told him that it was the kitten that was making the noise and he ordered us to drive it away. We tried to make the kitten leave, but it would not budge. My father took a hand. Scat! He shouted. The scrawny kitten lingered, brushing itself against our legs and me howling plaintively. Kill that damn thing, my father exploded. Do anything but get it away from here. He went inside, grumbling. I resented his shouting and it irked me that I could never make him feel my resentment. How could I hit back at him? Oh yes, he had said to kill the kitten and I will kill it. I knew that he had not really meant for me to kill the kitten, but my deep hate of him urged me toward a literal acceptance of his word. He said for us to kill the kitten, I told my brother. He didn't mean it, my brother said. He did, and I'm going to kill him. Then he will howl, my brother said. He can't howl if he's dead, I said. He didn't really say kill him, my brother protested. He did, I said, and you heard him. My brother ran away in fright. I found a piece of rope, made a noose, slipped it around the kitten's neck, pulled it over a nail, then jerked the animal clear of the ground. It gasped, slobbered spun, doubled, clawed the air frantically. Finally, its mouth gaped, and its pink, white tongue shot out stiffly. I tied the rope to a nail and went to find my brother. 
He was crouching behind a corner of the building. I killed him, I whispered. You did bad, my brother said. Now Papa can sleep, I said, deeply satisfied. He didn't mean for you to kill him, my brother said. Then why did he tell me to do it? I demanded. My brother could not answer. He stared fearfully at that dangling kitten. That kitten's going to get you, he warned me. That kitten can't even breathe now, I said. I'm going to tell, my brother said, running into the house. I waited, resolving to defend myself with my father's rash words, anticipating my enjoyment in repeating them to him, even though I knew that he had spoken them in anger. My mother hurried toward me, drying her hands upon her apron. She stopped and paled when she saw the kitten suspended from the rope. What in God's name have you done? She asked. The kitten was making noise and Papa said to kill it. I explained. You little fool! She said. Your father's going to beat you for this. But he told me to kill it. I said. You shut your mouth. She grabbed my hand and dragged me to my father's bedside and told him what I had done. You know better than that. My father stormed. You told me to kill him, I said. I told you to drive him away, he said. You told me to kill him, I countered positively. You get out of my eyes before I smack you down. My father bellowed in disgust, then turned over in bed. I had my first triumph over my father. I had made him believe that I had taken his words literally. He could not punish me now without risking his authority. I was happy because I had at last found a way to throw my criticism of him into his face. I had made him feel that if he whipped me for the killing of the kitten, I would never give serious weight to his words again. I had made him know that I had felt he was cruel and I had done it without his punishing me. But my mother, being more imaginative, retaliated with an assault upon my sensibilities that crushed me with the moral horror involved in taking a life. All that afternoon she directed toward me calculated words that spawned in my mind a horde of invisible demons bent upon exacting vengeance for what I had done. As evening drew near anxiety filled me and I was afraid to go into an empty room alone. You owe a debt you can never pay, my mother said. I'm sorry, I mumbled. Being sorry can't make that kitten live again, she said. Then, just before I was to go to bed, she uttered a paralyzing injunction. She ordered me to go out into the dark, dig a grave, and bury the kitten. No! I screamed, feeling that if I went out of doors, some evil spirit would whisk me away. Get out there and bury that poor kitten, she ordered. I'm scared. And wasn't that kitten scared when you put the rope around its neck, she asked. But it was only a kitten, I explained. But it was alive, she said. Can you make it live again? But Papa said to kill it. I said, trying to shift the moral blame upon my father. My mother whacked me across my mouth with the fist of her hand. You stop that lying. You know what he meant. I didn't, I I bawled. She shoved a tiny spade into my hands. Go out there and dig a hole and bury that kitten. I stumbled out into the black night, sobbing, my legs wobbly from fear. Though I knew that I had killed the kitten, my mother's words had made it live again in my mind. 
What would that kitten do to me when I touched it? Would it claw at my eyes? As I groped toward the dead kitten, my mother lingered behind me, unseen in the dark, her disembodied voice egging me more. Mama, come and stand by me, I begged. You didn't stand by that kitten, so why should I stand by you? She asked tauntingly from the menacing darkness. I can't touch it, I whimpered, feeling that the kitten was staring at me with reproachful eyes. Untie it, she ordered. Shuddering, I fumbled at the rope, and the kitten dropped to the pavement with a thud that echoed in my mind for many days and nights. Then, obeying my mother's floating voice, I hunted for a spot of earth, dug a shallow hole, and buried the stiff kitten. As I handled its cold body, my skin prickled. When I had completed the burial, I sighed and started back to the flat, but my mother caught hold of my hand and led me again to the kitten's grave. Shut your eyes and repeat after me, she said. I closed my eyes tightly, my hand clinging to hers. Dear God, our Father, forgive me, for I knew not what I was doing. Dear God, our Father, forgive me, for I knew not what I was doing, I repeated. And spare my poor life, even though I did not spare the life of the kitten. And spare my poor life, even though I did not spare the life of the kitten, I repeated. And while I sleep tonight, do not snatch the breath of life from me. I opened my mouth, but no words came. My mind was frozen with horror. I pictured myself gasping for breath and dying in my sleep. I broke away from my mother and ran into the night, crying, shaking with dread. No! I sobbed. My mother called to me many times, but I would not go to her. Well... I suppose you learn your lesson, she said at last. Contrite, I went to bed, hoping that I would never see another kitten. Hunger stole upon me so slowly that at first I was not aware of what hunger really meant. Hunger had always been more or less at my elbow when I played. But now I began to wake up at night to find hunger standing at my bedside, staring at me gauntly. The hunger I had known before, this had been no grim, hostile stranger. It had been a normal hunger that had made me beg constantly for bread, and when I ate a crust or two, I was satisfied. But this new hunger baffled me, scared me, made me angry and insistent. Whenever I begged for food now, my mother would pour me a cup of tea, which was still the clamor in my stomach for a moment or two, but a little later I would feel hunger nudging my ribs, twisting my empty guts until they ached. I would grow dizzy and my vision would dim. I became less active in my play, and for the first time in my life I had to pause and think of what was happening to me. Mama, I'm hungry, I complained one afternoon. Jump up and catch a congry, she said, trying to make me laugh and forget. What's a congry? It's what little boys eat when they get hungry, she said. What does it taste like? I don't know. Then why do you tell me to catch one? Because you said that you were hungry, she said, smiling. I sensed that she was teasing me, and it made me angry. But I'm hungry. I want to eat. You'll have to wait. But I want to eat now. But there's nothing to eat, 
she told me. Why? Just because there's none, she explained. But I want to eat. I said, beginning to cry. You'll just have to wait, she said again. But why? For God to send some food. When is he going to send it? I don't know. But I'm hungry. She was ironing, and she paused and looked at me with tears in her eyes. Where's your father? She asked me. I stared in bewilderment. Yes, it was true that my father had not come home to sleep for many days now, and I could make as much noise as I wanted. Though I had not known why he was absent, I had been glad that he was not there to shout his restrictions at me. But it had never occurred to me that his absence would mean that there would be no food. I don't know, I said. Who brings food into this house? My mother asked me. Papa, I said. He always brought food. Well, your father isn't here now, she said. Where is he? I don't know, she said. But I'm hungry. I whippered, stomping my feet. You'll have to wait until I get a job and buy food, she said. As the days slid past, the image of my father became associated with my pangs of hunger, and whenever I felt hunger, I thought of him with a deep biological bitterness. My mother finally went to work as a cook and left me and my brother alone in the flat each day with a loaf of bread and a pot of tea. When she returned at evening, she would be tired and dispirited and would cry a lot. Sometimes, when she was in despair, she would call us to her and talk to us for hours, telling us that now we had no father, that our lives would be different from those of other children, that we must learn as soon as possible to take care of ourselves, to dress ourselves, to prepare our own food, that we must take upon ourselves the responsibility of the flat while she worked. Half frightened, we would promise solemnly. We did not understand what had happened between our father and our mother, and the most that these long talks did to us was to make us feel a vague dread. Whenever we asked why father had left, she would tell us that we were too young to know. One evening, my mother told me that thereafter, I would have to do the shopping for food. She took me to the corner store to show me the way. I was proud. I felt like a grown-up. The next afternoon I looped the basket over my arm and went down the pavement toward the store. When I reached the corner, a gang of boys grabbed me, knocked me down, snatched the basket, took the money, and sent me running home in panic. That evening I told my mother what had happened, but she made no comment. She sat down at once, wrote another note, gave me more money, and sent me out to the grocery again. I crept down the steps and saw the same gang of boys playing down the street. I ran back into the house. What's the matter? my mother asked. It's those same boys, I said. They'll beat me. You gotta get over that, she said. Now go on. I'm scared, I said. Go on and don't pay any attention to them, she said. I went out of the door and walked briskly down the sidewalk, praying that the gang would not molest me. But when I came abreast of them, someone shouted, There he is! They came toward me and I broke into a wild run toward home. They overtook me and flung me to the pavement. I yelled, pleaded, kicked, but they wrenched the money out of my hand. They yanked me to my feet, gave me a few slaps, and sent me home sobbing. My mother met me at the door. They b b b beat me, 
I gasped. They t t t t t t took the money. I started up the steps, seeking the shelter of the house. Don't you come in here, my mother warned me. I froze in my tracks and stared at her. But they're, they're coming after me, I said. You just stay right where you are, she said in a deadly tone. I'm going to teach you this night to stand up and fight for yourself. She went into the house and I waited, terrified, wondering what she was about. Presently she returned with more money and another note. She also had a long heavy stick. Take this money, this note, and this stick, she said. Go to the store and buy those groceries. If those boys bother you, then fight. I was baffled. My mother was telling me to fight, a thing that she had never done before. But I'm scared. Don't you come into this house until you've gotten those groceries, she said. They'll beat me. They'll beat me, I said. Then stay in the streets. Don't come back here. I ran up the steps and tried to force my way past her into the house. A stinging slap came in on my jaw. I stood on the sidewalk crying. Please let me wait until tomorrow, I begged. No, she said. Go now. If you come back into this house without those groceries, I'll whip you. She slammed the door, and I heard the key turn in the lock. I shook with fright. I was alone upon the dark, hostile streets, and gangs were after me. I had the choice of being beaten at home or away from home. I clutched the stick, crying, trying to reason. If I were beaten at home, there was absolutely nothing that I could do about it. But if I were beaten in the streets, I had a chance to fight and defend myself. I walked slowly down the sidewalk, coming closer to the gang of boys holding the stick tightly. I was so full of fear that I could scarcely breathe. I was almost upon them now. There he is again. The cry went up. They surrounded me quickly and began to grab for my hand. I'll kill you! I threatened. They closed in. In blind fear, I let the stick fly. Feeling it crack against the boy's skull, I swung again, lambing another skull. Then another, realizing that they would retaliate if I let up for about a second, I fought to lay them low, to knock them cold, to kill them so they could not strike back at me. I flayed with tears in my eyes, teeth clenched, stark fear making me throw every ounce of my strength behind each blow. I hit again and again, dropping the money and the grocery list. The boys scattered, yelling, nursing their heads staring at me in utter disbelief. They had never seen such a frenzy. I stood panting, egging them on, taunting them to come on and fight. When they refused, I ran after them, and they tore out for their homes, screaming. The parents of the boys rushed into the streets and threatened me, and for the first time in my life, I shouted at grown-ups, telling them that I would give them the same if they bothered me. I finally found my grocery list and the money and went to the store. On my way back, I kept my stick poised for instant use, but there was not a single boy in sight. That night, I won the right to the streets of Memphis. Of a summer morning, when my mother had gone to work, I would follow a crowd of black children abandoned for the day by their working parents, to the bottom of a sloping hill whose top held a long row of ramshackle wooden outdoor privies whose open rear ends provided a raw 
and startling view. We would crouch at the foot of the slope and look up, a distance of 25 feet or more, and the secret and fantastic anatomies of black, brown, yellow, and ivory men and women. For hours we would laugh, point, whisper, joke, and identify our neighbors by the signs of their physiological oddities, commenting upon the difficulty or projectile force of their excretions. Finally, some grown up would see us and drive us away with disgusted shouts. Occasionally, children of two and three years of age would emerge from behind the hill with their faces smeared and their breath reeking. At last, a white policeman was stationed behind the privies to keep the children away, and our course in human anatomy was postponed. To keep us out of mischief, my mother often took my brother and me with her to her cooking job. Standing hungrily and silently in a corner of the kitchen, we would watch her go from the stove to the sink, from the cabinet to the table. I always loved to stand in the white folks' kitchen when my mother cooked, for it meant that I got occasional scraps of bread and meat, but many times I regretted having come, for my nostrils would be assailed with the scent of food that did not belong to me and which I was forbidden to eat. Toward evening, my mother would take the hot dishes into the dining room where the white people were seated, and I would stand as near the dining room door as possible to get a quick glimpse of the white faces gathered around the loaded table, eating, laughing, talking. If the white people left anything, my brother and I would eat well, but if they did not, we would have our usual bread and tea. Watching the white people eat would make my empty stomach turn, and I would grow vaguely angry. Why could I not eat when I was hungry? Why did I always have to wait until others were through? I could not understand why some people had enough food and others did not. I now found it irresistible to roam during the day while my mother was cooking in the kitchens of the white folks. A block away from our flat was a saloon in front of which I used to loiter all day long. Its interior was an enchanting place that both lured and frightened me. I would beg for pennies, then peer under the swinging doors to watch the men and women drink. When some neighbor would chase me away from the door, I would follow the drunks about the streets, trying to understand their mysterious mumblings, pointing at them, jeering, mocking, and taunting them about their lurching antics. For me, the most amusing spectacle was a drunken woman, stumbling and urinating, the dampness seeping down her stocking legs. Or I would stare in horror at a man retching. Somebody informed my mother about my fondness for the saloon, and she beat me. But it did not keep me from peering under the swinging doors and listening to the wild talk of drunks when she was at work. One summer afternoon, in my sixth year, while peering under the swinging doors of the neighborhood saloon, a black man caught hold of my arm and dragged me into its smoky and noisy depths. The odor of alcohol stung my nostrils. I yelled and struggled, trying to break free of him, afraid of the staring crowd of men and women, but he would not let me go. He lifted me and sat me upon the counter, put his hat upon my head, and ordered a drink for me. The tipsy men and women yelled with delight. Somebody tried to jam a cigar into my mouth but I twisted out of the way. How do you feel sitting there like a man, boy? A man asked. Make him drunk and he'll stop peeping in here, somebody said. Let's buy him drinks, somebody said. Some of my fright left as I stared about. Whiskey was set before me. 
Drink it, boy, somebody said. I shook my head. The man who had dragged me in urged me to drink it, telling me that it would not hurt me. I refused. Drink it. It'll make you feel good, he said. I took a sip and coughed. The men and women laughed. The entire crowd in the saloon gathered about me now, urging me to drink. I took another sip, then another. My head spun and I laughed. I was put on the floor and I ran giggling and shouting among the yelling crowd. As I would pass each man, I would take a sip from an offered glass. Soon I was drunk. A man called me to him and whispered some words into my ear and told me that he would give me a nickel if I went to a woman and repeated them to her. I told him that I would say them. He gave me the nickel and I ran to the woman and shouted the words. A gale of laughter went up in the saloon. Don't teach that boy that, someone said. He doesn't know what it is, another said. From then on, for a penny or a nickel, I would repeat to anyone whatever was whispered to me. In my foggy, tipsy state, the reaction of the men and women to my mysterious words enthralled me. I ran from person to person, laughing, hiccuping, spewing out filth that made them bend double with glee. Let that boy alone now, someone said. It ain't going to hurt him, another said. It's a shame, a woman said, giggling. Go home, boy. Somebody yelled at me. Toward the early evening, they let me go. I staggered along the pavements, drunk, repeating obscenities to the horror of the women I passed and to the amusement of the men en route to their homes from work. To beg drinks in the saloon became an obsession. Many evenings, my mother would find me wandering in the daze and take me home and beat me. But the next morning, no sooner had she gone to her job, then I would run to the saloon and wait for someone to take me in and buy me a drink. My mother protested tearfully to the proprietor of the saloon who ordered me to keep out of his place. But the men, reluctant to surrender their sport, would buy me drinks anyway, letting me drink out of their flask on the streets, urging me to repeat obscenities. I was a drunkard in my sixth year before I had begun school. With a gang of children, I roamed the streets, begging pennies from passers-by, haunting the doors of saloons, wandering farther and farther away from home each day. I saw more than I could understand and heard more than I could remember. The point of my life became for me the times when I could beg drinks. My mother was in despair. She beat me, then she prayed and wept over me, imploring me to be good telling me that she had to work, all of which carried no weight to my wayward mind. Finally, she placed me and my brother in the keeping of an old black woman who watched me every moment to keep me from running to the doors of the saloons to beg for whiskey. The craving for alcohol finally left me, and I forgot the taste of it. In the immediate neighborhood, there were many school children who in the afternoons would stop and play en route to their homes. They would leave their books upon the sidewalk and I would thumb through the pages and question them about the baffling black print. When I learned to recognize certain words, I told my mother that I wanted to learn to read and she encouraged me. Soon, I was able to pick my way through most of the children's books I ran across. There grew in me a consuming curiosity about what was happening around me, and when my mother came home from a hard day's work, I would question her so relentlessly about what I had heard in the streets that she refused to talk to me. One cold morning, my mother awakened me and told me that, because there was no coal in the house, she was taking my brother to the job with her, and that I must remain in bed until the coal she had ordered was delivered. For the payment of the coal, she left a note together with some money under the dresser scarf. I went back to sleep and was awakened by the ringing of the doorbell. I opened the door, let in the coal man, and gave him the money and the note. 
He brought in a few bushels of coal, then lingered, asking me if I were cold. Uh, yes, I said, shivering. He made a fire, then sat and smoked. How much change do I owe you? He asked me. Uh, I, I don't know, I said. Shame on you, he said. Don't you know how to count? No, sir, I said. Listen and repeat after me, he said. He counted to ten, and I listened carefully. Then he asked me to count alone, and I did. He then made me memorize the words, twenty, thirty, forty, etc. Then told me to add one, two, three, and so on. In about an hour's time, I had learned to count to a hundred, and I was overjoyed. Long after the coal man had gone, I danced up and down on the bed in my night clothes, counting again and again to a hundred, afraid that if I did not keep repeating the numbers, I would forget them. When my mother returned from her job that night, I insisted that she stand still and listen while I counted to one hundred. She was dumbfounded. After that, she taught me to read, told me stories. On Sundays, I would read the newspapers with my mother, guiding me and spelling out the words. I soon made myself a nuisance by asking far too many questions of everybody. Every happening in the neighborhood, no matter how trivial, became my business. It was in this manner that I first stumbled upon the relations between whites and blacks, and what I learned frightened me. Though I had long known that there were people called white people, it had never meant anything to me emotionally. I had seen white men and women upon the streets a thousand times, but they had never looked particularly white. To me, they were merely people like other people, yet somehow strangely different because I had never come in close touch with any of them. For the most part, I never thought of them. They simply existed somewhere in the background of the city as a whole. It might have been that my tardiness in learning to sense white people as white people came from the fact that many of my relatives were white-looking people. My grandmother, who was white as any white person, had never looked white to me. And when word circulated among the black people of the neighborhood that a black boy had been severely beaten by a white man, I felt that the white man had a right to beat the black boy, for I naively assumed that the white man must have been the black boy's father. And did not all fathers, like my father, have the right to beat their children? A paternal right was the only right to my understanding that a man had to beat a child. But when my mother told me that the white man was not the father of the black boy, was no kin to him at all, I was puzzled. Then why did the white man whip the black boy? I asked my mother. The white man did not whip the black boy, my mother told me. He beat the black boy. But why? You're too young to understand. I'm not going to let anybody beat me, I said stoutly. Then stop running wild in the streets, my mother said. I brooded for a long time about the seemingly causeless beating of the black boy by the white man. And the more questions I asked, the more bewildering it all became. Whenever I saw white people now, I stared at them, wondering what they were really like. I began school at Howard Institute at a later age than was usual. My mother had not been able to buy me the necessary clothes to make me presentable. The boys of the neighborhood took me to the school the first day, and when I reached the edge of the school, I became terrified. I wanted to return home, wanted to put it off. 
but the boy simply took my hand and pulled me inside the building. I was frightened speechless and the other children had to identify me, tell the teacher my name and address. I sat listening to the pupils recite, knowing and understanding what was being said and done, but utterly incapable of opening my mouth when called upon. The students around me seemed so sure of themselves that I despaired of ever being able to conduct myself as they did. On the playground at noon, I attached myself to a group of older boys and followed them about, listening to their talk, asking countless questions. During that noon hour, I learned all the four-letter words describing physiological and sex functions and discovered that I had known them before had spoken them in the saloon, although I had not known what they meant. A tall black boy recited a long, funny piece of doggerel, replete with filth, describing the physiological relations between men and women, and I memorized it word for word after having heard it but once. Yet, despite my retentive memory, I found it impossible to recite when I went back into the classroom. The teacher called upon me and I rose, holding my book before my eyes, but I could make no words come from me. I could feel the presence of the strange boys and girls behind me, waiting to hear me read, and fear paralyzed me. Yet, when school let out that first day, I ran joyously home with a brain burdened with racy and daring knowledge, but not a single idea from books. I gobbled my cold food that had been left covered on the table, seized a piece of soap, and rushed into the streets, eager to display all I had learned in school since morning. I went from window to window and printed in huge soap letters all my newly acquired four-letter words. I had written on nearly all the windows in the neighborhood when a white woman stopped me and drove me home. That night the woman visited my mother and informed her of what I had done, taking her from window to window and pointing out my inspirational scribblings. My mother was horrified. She demanded that I tell her where I learned the words, and she refused to believe me when I told her that I learned them at school. My mother got a pail of water and a towel and took me by the hand and led me to a smeared window. Now scrub until that word's gone, she ordered. Neighbors gathered, giggling, muttering words of pity and astonishment, asking my mother how on earth I could have learned so much so quickly. I scrubbed at the four-letter soap words and grew blind with anger. I sobbed, begging my mother to let me go, telling her that I would never write such words again. But she did not relent until the last soap word had been cleaned away. Never again did I write words like that. I kept them to myself. After my father's desertion, my mother's ardently religious disposition dominated the household, and I was often taken to Sunday school where I met God's representative in the guise of a tall black preacher. One Sunday, my mother invited the tall black preacher to a dinner of fried chicken. I was happy, not because the preacher was coming, but because of the chicken. One or two neighbors also were invited, but no sooner had the preacher arrived than I began to resent him, for I learned at once that he, like my father, was used to behaving and having his own way. The hour for dinner came, and I was wedged at the table between talking and laughing adults. In the center of the table was a huge platter of golden brown fried chicken. I compared the bowl of soup that sat before me with the crispy chicken and decided in favor of the chicken. The others began to eat their soup, but I could not touch mine. Eat your soup, my mother said. I don't want any, I said. You won't get anything else until you've eaten your soup, she said. The preacher had finished his soup, 
and had asked that the platter of chicken be passed to him. It galled me. He smiled, cocked his head this way and that, picking out choice pieces. I forced a spoonful of soup down my throat and looked to see if my speed matched that of the preacher. It did not. There were already bare chicken bones on his plate. He was reaching for more. I tried to eat my soup faster, but it was no use. The other people were now serving themselves chicken, and the platter was more than half empty. I gave up and sat staring in despair at the vanishing pieces of fried chicken. Eat your soup or you won't get anything, my mother warned. I looked at her appealingly and could not answer as piece after piece of chicken was eating. I was unable to eat my soup at all. I grew hot with anger. The preacher was laughing and joking and the grown-ups were hanging on his words. My growing hate of the preacher finally became more important than God or religion and could no longer contain itself. I leapt up from the table knowing that I should be ashamed of what I was doing but unable to stop and screamed running blindly from the room that preacher's going to eat all the chicken I bawled the preacher tossed back his head and roared with laughter but my mother was angry and told me that I was to have no dinner because of my bad manners when I awakened one morning my mother told me that we were going to see a judge who would make my father support me and my brother an hour later, all three of us were sitting in a huge crowded room. I was overwhelmed by the many faces and the voices which I could not understand. High above me was a white face, which my mother told me was the face of the judge. Across the huge room sat my father, smiling confidently, looking at us. My mother warned me not to be fooled by my father's friendly manner. She told me that the judge might ask me questions, and then if he did, I must tell him the truth. I agreed, yet I hoped that the judge would not ask me anything. For some reason, the entire thing struck me as being useless. I felt that if my father was going to feed me, then he would have done so regardless of what the judge said to him. And I did not want my father to feed me. I was hungry. But my thoughts of food did not now center about him. I waited, growing restless, hungry. My mother gave me a dry sandwich, and I munched and stared, longing to go home. Finally, I heard my mother's name called. She rose and began weeping so copiously that she could not talk for a few moments. At last, she managed to say that her husband had deserted her and two children that her children were hungry, that they stayed hungry, that she worked, that she was trying to raise them alone. Then my father was called. He came forward jauntily, smiling. He tried to kiss my mother, but she turned away from him. I only heard one sentence of what he said. I'm doing all I can, yeah. He mumbled, grinning. It had been painful to sit and watch my mother crying and my father laughing, and I was glad when we were outside in the sunny streets. Back at home, my mother wept again and talked complainingly about the unfairness of the judge who had accepted my father's word. After the court scene, I tried to forget my father. I did not hate him. I simply did not want to think of him. Often, when we were hungry, my mother would beg me to go to my father's job and ask him for a dollar, a dime, a nickel. But I would never consent to go. I did not want to see him. My mother fell ill, and the problem of food became an acute, daily agony. Hunger was with us always. Sometimes the neighbors would feed us, or a dollar bill would come in the mail from my grandmother. It was winter, and I would buy a dime's worth of coal each morning from the corner coal yard and lug it home in paper bags. For a time, 
I remained out of school to wait upon my mother. Then Granny came to visit us and I returned to school. At night there were long halting discussions about our growing to live with Granny, but nothing came of it. Perhaps there was not enough money for railroad fare. Angered by having been hauled into court, my father now spurned us completely. I heard long, angrily whispered conversations between my mother and grandmother to the effect that that woman ought to be killed for breaking up a home. What irked me was the ceaseless talk and no action. If someone had suggested that my father be killed, I would perhaps have become interested. If someone had suggested that his name never be mentioned, I would no doubt have agreed. If someone had suggested that we move to another city, I would have been glad. But there was only endless talk that led nowhere and I began to keep away from home as much as possible, preferring the simplicity of the streets to the worried, futile talk at home. Finally, we could no longer pay the rent for our dingy flat. The few dollars that Granny had left us before she went home were gone. Half sick and in despair, my mother made the rounds of the charitable institutions seeking help. She found an orphan home that agreed to assume the guidance of me and my brother, provided my mother worked and made small payments. My mother hated to be separated from us, but she had no choice. The orphan home was a two-story frame building set amid trees in a wide green field. My mother ushered me and my brother one morning into the building and into the presence of a tall, gaunt, mulatto woman who called herself Miss Simon. At once, she took a fancy to me and I was frightened speechless. I was afraid of her the moment I saw her and my fear lasted during my entire stay in the home. The house was crowded with children and there was always a storm of noise. The daily routine was blurred to me and I never quite grasped it. The most abiding feeling I had each day was hunger and fear. The meals were skimpy and there were only two of them. Just before we went to bed each night, we were given a slice of bread smeared with molasses. The children were silent, hostile, vindictive, continuously complaining of hunger. There was an overall atmosphere of nervousness and intrigue, of children telling tales upon others, of children being deprived of food, to punish them. The home did not have the money to check the growth of the wide stretches of grass by having it mown. So it had to be pulled by hand. Each morning after we had eaten a breakfast that seemed like no breakfast at all, an older child would lead a herd of us to the vast lawn and we would get to our knees and wrench the grass loose from the dirt with our fingers. At intervals, Miss Simon would make a tour of inspection, examining the pile of pulled grass beside each child, scolding or praising according to the size of the pile. Many mornings I was too weak from hunger to pull the grass. I would grow dizzy and my mind would become blank and I would find myself after an interval of unconsciousness upon my hands and knees, my head whirling my eyes staring in bleak astonishment at the green grass, wondering where I was, feeling that I was emerging from a dream. During the first days, my mother came each night to visit me and my brother. Then her visit stopped. I began to wonder if she too, like my father, had disappeared into the unknown. I was rapidly learning to distrust everything and everybody. When my mother did come, 
I asked her why had she remained away so long, and she told me that Miss Simon had forbidden her to visit us, that Miss Simon had said that she was spoiling us with too much attention. I begged my mother to take me away. She wept and told me to wait, that soon she would take us to Arkansas. She left, and my heart sank. Miss Simon tried to win my confidence. She asked me if I would like to be adopted by her if my mother consented, and I said no. She would take me into her apartment and talk to me, but her words had no effect. Dread and distrust had already become a daily part of my being, and my memory grew sharp, my senses more impressionable. I began to be aware of myself as a distinct personality striving against others. I held myself in, afraid to act or speak until I was sure of my surroundings, feeling most of the time that I was suspended over a void. My imagination soared. My imagination soared. I dreamed of running away. Each morning I vowed that I would leave the next morning. But the next morning always found me afraid. One day, Miss Simon told me that thereafter I was to help her in the office. I ate lunch with her and, strangely, when I sat facing her at the table, my hunger vanished. The woman killed something in me. Next, she called me to her desk where she sat addressing envelopes. Step up close to the desk, she said. Don't be afraid. I went and stood at her elbow. There was a wart on her chin and I stared at it. Now, take a blotter from over there and blot each envelope after I'm through writing on it, she instructed me pointing to a blotter that stood about a foot from my hand. I stared and did not move or answer. Take the blotter, she said. I wanted to reach for the blotter and succeeded only in twitching my arm. Here, she said sharply, reaching for the blotter and shoving it into my fingers. She wrote an envelope and pushed it toward me, holding the blotter in my hand. I stared at the envelope and could not move. Blot it, she said. I could not lift my hand. I knew what she had said. I knew what she wanted me to do. And I had heard her correctly. I wanted to look at her and say something. Tell her why I could not move, but my eyes were fixed upon the floor. I could not summon enough courage while she sat there looking at me to reach over the yawning space of twelve inches and blot the wet ink on the envelope. Blot it, she said shortly. Still I could not move or answer. Look at me. I could not lift my eyes. She reached her hand to my face and I twisted away. What's wrong with you? she demanded. I began to cry and she drove me from the room. I decided that as soon as night came, I would run away. The dinner bell rang and I did not go to the table, but hid in a corner of the hallway. When I heard the dishes rattling at the table, I opened the door and ran down the walk to the street. The dusk was falling. Doubt made me stop. Would I go back? No. Hunger was back there, and fear. I went on, coming to concrete sidewalks. People passed me. Where was I going? I did not know. The farther I walked, the more frantic I became. In a confused and vague way, I knew that I was doing more running away from than running towards something. I stopped. The streets seemed dangerous. The buildings were massive and dark. The moon shone and the trees loomed frighteningly. No, I could not go on. I will go back. 
but I had walked so far and had turned too many corners and had not kept track of the direction which way led back to the orphan home I did not know I was lost I stood in the middle of the sidewalk and cried a white policeman came to me and I wondered if he was going to beat me he asked me what was the matter and I told him that I was trying to find my mother his white face created a new fear in me I was remembering the tale of the white man who had beaten the black boy a crowd gathered and I was urged to tell where I lived curiously I was too full of fear to cry now I wanted to tell the white face that I had run off from an orphan home and that Miss Simon ran it but I was afraid finally I was taken to the police station where I was fed I felt better I sat in a big chair where I was surrounded by white policemen but they seemed to ignore me through the window I could see that night had completely fallen and that lights now gleamed in the streets I grew sleepy and dozed my shoulder was shaking gently and I opened my eyes and looked into a white face of another policeman who was sitting beside me he asked me questions in a quiet confidential tone and quite before I knew it he was not white anymore I told him that I had run away from an orphan home and that Miss Simon ran it it was but a matter of minutes before I was walking alongside a policeman heading toward the home the policeman led me to the front gate and I saw Miss Simon watching for me on the steps she identified me and I was left in her charge I begged her not to beat me but she yanked me upstairs into an empty room and lashed me thoroughly sobbing I slunk off to bed resolved to run away again but I was watched closely after that my mother was informed upon her next visit that I had tried to run away and she was terribly upset why did you do it she asked I don't want to stay here I told her but you must she said how can I work if I'm to worry about you you must remember that you have no father I'm doing all I can I don't want to stay here I repeated then if I take you to your father I don't want to stay with him either I said but I want you to ask him for enough money for us to go to my sisters in Arkansas she said again I was faced with choices I did not like but I finally agreed after all my hate for my father was not so great and urgent as my hate for the orphan home my mother held to her idea and one night a week or so later I found myself standing in a room in a frame house my father and a strange woman were sitting before a bright fire that blazed in a grate my mother and I were standing about six feet away as though we were afraid to approach them any closer it's not for me my mother was saying it's for your children that I'm asking you for money <laughs> I ain't got nothing my father said laughing come here boy the strange woman called to me I looked at her and did not move give him a nickel the woman said he's cute come here Richard my father said stretching out his hand I backed away shaking my head keeping my eyes on the fire he is a cute child the strange woman said you ought to be ashamed my mother said to the strange woman you're starving my children now don't you all fight my father said laughing I'll take that poke and hit you I blurted at my father 
he looked at my mother and laughed louder. <laughs> you told him to say that, he said. Don't say such things, Richard, my mother said. You ought to be dead, I said to that strange woman. The woman laughed and threw her arms about my father's neck. I grew ashamed and wanted to leave. How can you starve your children? My mother asked. Let Richard stay with me, my father said. Do you want to stay with your father, Richard? My mother asked. No, I said. You'll get plenty to eat, he said. I'm hungry now, I told him. But I won't stay with you. Oh, give the boy a nickel, the woman said. My father ran his hand into his pocket and pulled out a nickel. Here, Richard, he said. Don't take it, my mother said. Don't teach him to be a fool, my father said. Here, Richard, take it. I looked at my mother, at the strange woman, at my father, then into the fire. I wanted to take the nickel, but I did not want to take it from my father. You ought to be ashamed, my mother said, weeping. Give me your son a nickel when he's hungry. If there's a God, he'll pay you back. That's all I got, my father said, laughing again and returning the nickel to his pocket. We left. I had the feeling that I had had to do with something unclean. Many times in the years after that, the image of my father and the strange woman, their faces lit by the dancing flames, would surge up in my imagination so vivid and strong that I felt I could reach out and touch it. I would stare at it, feeling that it possessed some vital meaning which always eluded me. A quarter of a century was to elapse between the time when I saw my father sitting with the strange woman and the time when I was to see him again, standing alone upon the red clay of a Mississippi plantation, a sharecropper clad in ragged overalls, holding a muddy hose in his gnarled, vain hands. A quarter of a century during which my mind and consciousness had become so greatly and violently altered that when I tried to talk to him I realized that though ties of blood made us kin though I could see a shadow of my face in his face though there was an echo of my voice in his voice we were forever strangers speaking a different language living on vastly different planes of reality that day a quarter of a century later when I visited him on the plantation he was standing against the sky, smiling toothlessly, his hair whitened, his body bent, his eyes glazed with dim recollection. His fearsome aspect of twenty-five years ago gone forever from him. I was overwhelmed to realize that he could never understand me or the scalding experiences that had swept me beyond his life and into an era of living that he could never know. I stood before him, poised, my mind aching as it embraced the simple nakedness of his life, feeling how completely his soul was impressioned by the slow flow of the seasons, by wind and rain and sun, how fastened were his memories to a crude and raw past, how chained were his actions and emotions to the direct, animalistic impulses of his withering body. From the white landowners above him, there had not been handed to him a chance to learn the meaning of loyalty, of sentiment, of tradition. Joy was as unknown to him as was despair. As a creature of the earth, he endured hardy, whole, seemingly indestructible, with no regrets and no hope. He asked easy, drawling questions about me, his other son, his wife, and he laughed, amused, 
when I informed him of their destinies. I forgave him and pitied him as my eyes looked past him to the unpainted wooden shack from far beyond the horizons that bound this bleak plantation there had come to me through my living the knowledge that my father was a black peasant who had gone to the city seeking life but who had failed in the city a black peasant whose life had been hopelessly snarled in the city and who had at last fled the city that same city which had lifted me in its burning arms and borne me toward alien and undreamed of shores of knowing. End of chapter 1